All right, that's a, that's a couple of minutes then, and uh, we've got quite a few uh, people on the call, which is really good. So, uh, so hello everyone. Um, hope you're in, enjoying your Leeds Digital Festival so far, and, and thanks for joining Ed and me to, to hear about overcoming the XY problem. Um, I'll give a proper explanation of what the XY problem is later, but in, in simple terms, it's about asking the wrong questions. It, it's it's not about uh, the disproportionate number of men in tech roles, as uh, a, a colleague with a genetic background pointed out to us, um, which is, is definitely a topic for a, a whole other talk. Um, and I, I'm sure someone else would do that more justice than the two men on the call could. Um, so we'll, we'll get straight into it then. But be uh, before we do, uh, we've got um, a Slido set of questions. So please head to slido.com in your browser and um, enter the code XYQ or scan the QR code on the screen. Um, and, and please just drop us some questions in there uh, that we can kind of go through at, at the end. I'll leave this code up for, for a little bit longer, but the link is in the top right of the slides as well. If you just want to, if you want to grab that, uh, we'll come back to the questions uh, at the end of the talk. If any of the questions are XY problems, then we'll try to answer them, but we, we might not be able to. So we'll give it a go. Um, yeah, without further ado then, quick introductions before we start. Um, I'm Chris, I'm a principal architect at ANSA. Uh, before being an architect, I've been an engineering manager and an engineer in, in agile teams. And I've seen this problem manifest uh, a number of times. So uh, in the past, I've also been quite active on Stack Overflow. Um, and you see the problem quite often there as well. Ed? Yeah, uh, I'm Ed Bromhead, uh, principal consultant and head of business consulting at Arts Digital. Uh, my background's mainly finance and wealth management. Started as a business analyst, uh, business analyst uh, at Norwich Union, as it was then, and then, then into Aviva. Uh, and since then, I've moved across and worked through several different organisations, uh, mainly on large-scale wealth uh, management platform migrations. Thanks, Ed. Just to frame the talk a little bit then, so we'll explain in a little bit more detail what the XY problem is, give uh, give a few examples, some some war stories that we've we've had in the past, and um, we, we'll talk a little bit about how this will impact people and projects that they're working on, uh, and then Ed will discuss some some simple analysis techniques to to kind of to work on that before sharing how educating people really helps to prevent it happening in in future. Okay. Let's start with a quick overview of what the XY problem is to start with. It's basically where someone asks about their, their attempted solution rather than about their real problem. It's, it's a communication problem. You, you see it a lot in technical support, help desks, public communication like Stack Overflow or IRC. It's got similar origins to the jargon file in that respect for anyone who's old enough and nerdy enough to remember what that is. Um, but it, it can happen in any requirements gathering and consulting scenarios, as we'll see. Uh, if, if anyone's ever asked you a question that's sort of left you thinking, but but why do you actually want to do that? Uh, that's the sort of thing that you'll kind of, you have seen it before. It, it occurs when someone essentially tries to solve a problem on their own without really discussing their train of thought with, with, with other people. And it obscures real issues and it can even introduce more problems. So looking at it in detail then, First, the, the user wants to do a thing, X, but, but they're not really sure how to go about it. And they kind of believe that they can fumble their way to some sort of solution if they can only manage to do Y, which would be great, if, but they don't have a clue how to do Y either. So, so they go and ask for help. So that help could be like a support ticket, could be on a help forum, uh, or it could just be asking someone in the team. Crucially, when they do this, they only ask about Y, they don't mention X at all. So other people try to, to help them out with Y, but really confused because Y seems like a strange problem to want to solve. And after much interaction and wasted time, finally it becomes clear that they wanted to do X in the first place. So, so how do we, we get here? It's, um, it's an example of the, stu stu uh, the sunk cost fallacy, really. It's, uh, you know, people getting this, their train of thought stuck on this one approach and they've put increased value in this, uh, this dead end because they've forgotten the importance of, uh, of trial and error when solving problems. But perhaps they've also forgotten the importance of more collaborative ways of working, which, which really does make it easier to catch these sort of problems early on. And in reality, the, the method that they got stuck with, their why, might even be the most 
convoluted or complicated way to do things. And that's probably why they got stuck. So let's just have a look at a few examples. This is, if you go to like look at XY problem on, on the internet, this is the, an early and often used example. This was from an IRC chat. Someone was asking for help with a, with a bash script. And the asker has got a problem to solve and has jumped straight into an assumption about the way to solve it. They said they want the last three characters of file name. You know, why, might, why might you want that? The, the, the helper here has enough intuition to recognize what they're, what they're really trying to do. They're trying to get the extension of the file name. And, and there's no guarantee that extensions are three characters. Uh, and there's a much better way to do what they actually want. Notice the, the crucial absence here of what they're actually trying to do when they ask the initial question. Uh, in this case, it was, it was quite easy to, to deduce the X from the Y, but in, in practice, it can take a lot of time and frustration to get to this point. This, this is the example that for me that originally inspired me to do the talk uh, a number of years ago. A uh, question that came to me from a product owner, I was an engineer. Uh, I guess ideally you'd have a BA in a conversation like this to more formally analyze requirements, but pragmatically these direct questions are, are common to people in the team. And, and this is why we all need the tools to be able to deal with those. So the, the problem that I was posed was I, I was asked if we could track device orientation when, when launching a game and, and record it in an analytics platform. I said, sure, that, you know, that's, that's kind of possible, it's, it's a bit tricky. There's complexities, there's, there's race conditions, there's other weird scenarios to consider, but kind of puzzled enough by the question to, to dig deeper. Turns out that some new games were being launched across a variant of different apps, and they were launching in, in one app in Portrait and another app in, in Landscape, and they were struggling to, to differentiate the source of those game launches. Realistically, the, you know, the problem wasn't anything to do with orientation. It was about identifying which app once it was, was being used to launch. And, and there was a much easier solution for, for us to actually to, to kind of expose that information. And the product owner really thought that they were helping by solve part of the puzzle for us. But, but really, it's making it much harder for, for someone to, to kind of do something about it. In the scheme of things, this was a, this was a quick conversation. It was easily solved. But, but if that conversation hadn't happened, or, or more importantly, if we didn't create an environment where that conversation was okay to happen, then things could be quite different, you know, just presented with, uh, please deliver this. Uh, and, and someone would perhaps question why, or just crack on and, and deliver the, the very difficult thing. Here's a, here's a third example from, a, from an operations support ticket. If you've, if you've ever worked in IT support, you've probably seen a lot of tickets like this, and you might even have a good inkling of where this one is going. But you can already see the XY problem here. Even though the person writing the tickets actually attempted to give their reason, their X, they've pretty much said, my computer isn't working. So, so without more information, the description of the problem is pretty useless. And their guess at a solution isn't really helpful either. Ed's going to cover this particular problem in a little bit when he talks about how to approach them. So, so I'll leave this one in your mind for now um, and just talk about some of the impacts. So how can it impact projects and people? From a, from a technical perspective, it can lead to, to overly complex solutions like, like that analytics one. The, the complexity uh, could be compound you could keep building hacks on hacks, you know, or just putting out fires rather than fixing the underlying problem. In the, in the sense that we're really just here to try and maximize value in what we're delivering. The, the, the big problem is that we're probably just working on the wrong thing. And if you take that up to a more strategic level, um, the XY problem can be devastating for companies. It's, you know, losing months or, or even years on, on solving the wrong problem. And that's, that's just the technology side of things, you know, in terms of interpersonal impacts, team members could really become frustrated or mistrustful of each other because ultimately they're not satisfied with the outcome. And that, and that can be a, a vicious cycle as well. If the, if the right problems aren't being solved, people can close up, sort of share less and less information about what they're trying to accomplish. And you see that how that sort of snowballs. This, can, it can build up to a lack of empowerment because you're only seeing part of the picture and you're not being involved in the wider solution. 
uh, Daniel Pink talks about autonomy, mastery and purpose as, as what motivates people. But how can you be autonomous if you only have half of the story? How can you find purpose without knowing why you're doing what it is you're doing? Okay, over to Ed to talk about how to approach some of this stuff. Yeah, so um, Charles, I, I can see your comment there on Slido uh, already, and you're absolutely right. And if, if we roll into the next slide, then uh, we'll start approaching that a little bit as well. Um, it is true, no, no, no one comes to us, um, I don't know, Chris, if you move the slide on, there we go, brilliant. Um, no one comes to us for help if everything's going well. There's always something that's going wrong, and, and as you say, Charles, they always seem to think they're the expert. They know what the solution is. They know what they need to do to solve that problem. Um, but when they come to us like that, when they come to us to say what, what it is that they want, as opposed to what it is that they need, we need to go back, take a few steps back and get into the problem. And what is the problem? Uh, and how do we define that? And the easiest way is a problem statement. Uh, Nielsen Norman there saying that it's a concise description of the problem that needs to be solved. Uh, and, and one way, uh, and a simple way of framing that, and, getting that problem statement really shaped out nicely is the five W's. Um, the five W's is a journalistic technique. Uh, it's, it's used by journalists when they're writing the story. Who is the story about? What is it about? When did it happen? Where did it happen? And, and why did this thing go on? And, and what is the, the thing that we need to be worried about? Uh, and I'll take you through each one of those uh, coming up. And we'll just sort of, sort of go through them and just show how that shapes up a, a problem statement and allows users to really think about what it is that's causing them those problems not necessarily what they think the problem is but what the actual problem is that, that needs to be solved and then we can go on and move into developing a good solution that meets that problem well as opposed to just maybe putting a band-aid on rather than giving them stitches so to speak um so starting off then who uh very very important place to start who does this problem actually impact who, who is having this trouble um, is it just the person that, that's raised the ticket? Is it just the person that's asked for the change? Uh, are there other users in the same team using the same system, having the same problem? Are there different user groups? Do they all work in the same building? And we'll get into that a little bit later in the where as well. But um, the, the who of the user groups that this impacts does shed a light on one, who do you need to also go and talk to? If you're only getting one person's input into the problem, you may not fully understand that problem. You understand the problem for that person, as opposed to what is the problem the whole user group's experiencing? Are they all experiencing it in the same way? Or are they experiencing it in different ways? So finding out who is really important to being able to then frame the problem. Um, and then into the what. Um, uh, it's really important, and I've, I've put it on this side, but it applies to all the sides really. Open, I ask open-ended questions. Um, we, we do get in the habit of saying, uh, does it do this? Yes, does it do that? No, but it doesn't really enrich the conversation so much. So asking what is the problem you're trying to solve um, really starts getting people thinking about, uh, yeah, so uh, what it is, is every time I press M on my keyboard, it puts up C. Okay, well, let's start looking at your keyboard settings. Let's look at someone being playing with your keyboard uh, and switch the letters around and you've not noticed. That's a common one with M and N, recommend it to, to do on your colleagues. If you swap the M and N around, no one notices, but they wonder what's going on. Um, what are you trying to do? What's stopping you from doing that? Uh, uh, and what would they do to solve the problem? Each person you talk to, ask them, what would you do to solve that problem? You start to solutionize, but also at the same time that they're giving you an insight into what they think the problem is and how they would solve it. And you can use that as a little bit more of a segue into delving deeper into the problem. Uh, when? So th this is the example that came up earlier, uh, and Chris alluded that we'd uh, get to it eventually. Um, th this is an anecdote, I think, more than a, than a real life story that was given to me, but uh, it's happened so long ago, I can't remember either way. But essentially, there, there was a group of virtual machines on a desk. Uh, everyone in the office knew not to touch them, don't do anything with them. Um, uh, but between five and six in the morning, they, they just shut down. And someone would have to come in and turn them back on again. Um, and no one quite understood what was going on. It wasn't until, so initially we got the call, can you upgrade, can you rebuild the PCs? Something's going on with the PCs, they're, they're rubbish, they're not working. Uh, we thought, well, when does this happen? Well, it looks like it's between five and six every day. Okay, great. Anyone in the office at that time that can monitor the computer, see so if the error message comes up on screen, 
anything like that. Yeah, the cleaners are there. Can you can you get them to watch it? Every time the cleaners are asked to observe these between five and six, never turned off. Uh, computers worked absolutely fine. No problems were, were seen. When the cleaners stopped observing them, suddenly the computer started breaking down again. Um, at some point, someone asked the cleaners, what, what do you do between five and six? Um, and it was, we hoover the floor. Uh, and what was happening was someone was going along, unplugging the computers, plugging their hoover in, hoovering the floor, plugging the computers back in. Everything looked fine when everyone came in in the morning. What they hadn't seen was that between five and six, people are cleaning the floor and unplugging the computers. So rather than having to rebuild the computers, rather than having to upgrade them or do anything like that, a simple sticker on the plug saying, do not unplug, was enough of a solution to stop that problem ever occurring again. So understanding the when uh, is really important. If it only happens during a specific time frame, what else is happening during that time frame? Who else is there? Is there anything that can interfere with it? Uh, can really help you get down to that, that cause of the problem as well. Touched a little bit on where already, early on, is it in the same building? Uh, but understand the locality of the problem uh, can really shed further light on it as well. Uh, does it happen in a single location? Is it a single desk? Is it a single floor in the building? Could it be someone down to networking, routing, all of that side of stuff? Is it regionality or cultural differences? Uh, and is the problem only between certain locations? And that's a problem that I've, I've encountered myself. Um, between two locations, I joined Aviva uh, when I was quite a few years ago. Um, and at the time, Aviva had just begun their, their IT outsourcing. They, they brought in an Indian outsourcer and we were moving off testing and development to offshore locations in India. Uh, and as requirements providers, as BAs, we'd sit down with the testers and we'd just go, are you happy with these? Do you understand them? And the answer always came back is yes. But when it came to testing, uh, we we're finding the tests weren't perhaps being performed correctly, scenarios were being missed, uh, and there, there was a problem there. They, they were saying yes up front, uh, but then we were getting poor output in the test perspective. Uh, and we're, what we discovered is actually, at the time, there's a big cultural difference between how we worked in the UK uh, and, and how people in India worked, where they would just say yes. Um, they, they wouldn't necessarily be open to challenging people who they saw as being in positions of authority, like we were, because we were the customer, so you didn't challenge the customer. Um, we understood that we, we couldn't change culture. It, it's a very big thing to do that, and um, I have observed that over the last 15 years, that they're definitely very much more open to challenging now, and we have really good conversations. But just by changing our questioning approach, by asking more open questions, in this scenario, what do you think would happen? Have you thought about um, what this requirement, what the negative of this is? So if this requirement isn't met, what would happen? By, by changing that and asking them to explain back to us what that requirement was, what that scenario was, we got really better output in the testing position. So understanding those cultural differences that can really generate a problem about knowing um, is a big, big part sometimes of actually solving the problem where it's between two different locations or, or two different regions. Uh, why? Why? My favourite one. Um, I'm going to introduce you probably to, to the best BA I've ever met here in one minute. He's in preschool at the moment, um, but he is a three-year-old. Uh, and, and when you ask him why, the best thing to do is be like a three-year-old. Here he is. Um, that, that little boy could negotiate hostages. Just the, the kidnapper would break down after about the 50th why uh, of why can't you let the, the hostage go. Um, but re realistically, there's a very simple technique. Uh, every BA uses it, and it's probably the first one every BA is taught. Uh, I was taught it on my first day by, by my mentor, and he said to me, if people come to me and complain that you're asking why too much, you're doing your job properly. Uh, and it's a simple technique just called the five whys. Step one, you, you ask why. Uh, what, why do you need this? Why do you want that? Uh, and whatever the response is, step two is you ask why. Uh, and then, then you just keep delving down. Step three, why? Uh, step four, why? Uh, and step five, why? And I have to say, over the last year, I've realised how incredibly annoying BAs are when they keep asking why. Um, but that, that is it, really. The, the most simplest of techniques uh, will get you really down to the crux uh, of the issue. Um, people will start thinking about, actually, yeah, is it that? Is there something else? Um, 
you don't have to ask it five times. You can ask it more times if, if you feel like you still not quite nailed it down. Um, and you can ask it fewer times if the person you're asking the question to becomes violent. Um, uh, <laughs> I can't see anyone, I can't hear anyone, but I'm hoping everyone's laughing hard. Um, uh, but that's that's really it. Um, and provided you've sort of gone through that, if you looked at the five W's, you feel you're, you're comfortable on that, um, you then can sort of start to say, well, have I found the problem? How do you know that you've got to the root cause? Uh, one of the easiest ways is, is that problem is recognizable. If you say to the users, do you have this problem? And you frame the problem back to them and they go, oh yeah, yeah, 100% we have that problem. You know, you got to the root cause of the problem. You know, you got to it as well when it's one problem at a time. You can have a solution that solves multiple problems, but you can't have a problem, multiple problems kind of just in one statement. It's hard to manage. It's hard to then be able to test against and say, have we met all of these if it's just one problem statement, which is contained in multiple problems? And it's clear and concise. Uh, it doesn't need to go on for days. It doesn't need to be sort of several paragraphs or several pages. A, a clear one line sentence that just frames the problem really well. Um, and, and you can answer those five W's. Who does it affect? What is the problem? When does it happen? If, if all the time, it's only during this time. When does it occur? Uh, and why does the problem occur? Uh, if you can't answer those, then you know you've clearly identified the problem and you can begin working with users and architects and developers to define the best solution to, to meet that problem. All right, thanks very much for that, Ed. Uh, so I, I just wanna sum up then. Uh, we've, we've shown some, some XY problems, we've uh, seen some impacts of them and Ed's talked uh, about some good analysis techniques we can use to, to to deal with that when we do see it happen but but really we want we want to avoid it altogether uh, and and how could we how can we go about that so if you're the one that's asking the questions you really want to think about the information that you're presenting when you're doing that yes layers of abstraction can can be important when you're when you're trying to to work with uh, with a, a bigger team but you've got to make sure to provide some sort of context about what the expected outcome actually is, especially if you propose a solution within your uh, in your idea, be be open to changing that. A critical part of teamwork is really understanding that sometimes we don't make the best decisions on our own, and that is okay. On the other side, then, if if you're the one that's actually giving help, go the extra mile. Really, don't just answer a question. Help to solve the problem. And you can do this by asking the questions and really getting to the bottom of the issue, uh, as Ed's talked about. And, and what I'll say just finally is that these things are possible in any environment, but they're much simpler by comparison in an environment that, that encourages the behavior to ask these sort of things. So as a consultancy, Answer talked about being an outcomes-based business. And what does that mean? We, you know, but really behind all of that is a huge amount of effort in fostering trust, transparency, emotional intelligence, and those things are hugely important to, to making questions easier to ask uh, and easier to, to challenge and discuss. And, and when you're working on these things together, ultimately it does make the, the whole process go a lot smoother. So, uh, so I hope those, uh, hope those are good ideas for you to be able to think about avoiding these sort of things and dealing with them when you do see them. But really do make the environment safe for those things to happen in the first place. Okay, um, we'll, we'll go into questions in a little bit, but just uh, just for a second, I wanna talk, uh, take a minute and talk about Action for Children. It's a charity that we work quite closely with the answer. A number of people will be partaking in the Boycott Your Bed Challenge in a couple of weeks. So sleeping out in the streets of Leeds and in the cold, hopefully not the rain, but you know, you can't control that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, really wanting to raise money for an awareness for a wonderful cause. So so please do take the, the moment to to donate if you uh, if you can do that. The QR code on the bottom there, and you say every every forty quid we can uh, pay for gas and electricity for a family for a week. So uh, so it's it's a really good cause, and we've been really close to it over a number of years. I know people have done this in the past. Ed, you've been roped into it this year. Uh, no, unfortunately, I always seem to have something on that weekend. So, um, yeah, I've not, not done it yet, but one year I will get around to doing it. 
Okay, I I'm, I'm just want to go into questions. Uh, there's a uh, there's the slider link is still there as well. Uh, we've we've had a couple of questions on the uh, on Slido, but uh, obviously we can open the floor up as well. And people, if you feel comfortable, just uh, just ask us questions on there. I'm going to jump onto Slido for now first. Though. I'm going to jump this one to the top. Naive question: What is B8? It's it's, it's never a naive, naive question at all. Um, frankly, you know, it's, it's our fault for not for making assumptions on, on that one, really. So, so, so that's our bad, really. Uh, Ed is a BA. Uh, a BA is a business analyst, I guess. Is the Ed, Ed's title probably covers a lot wider than that, but that's that's what you yeah. are really in the underneath it. Do you want to tell us a bit more about the role, Ed? Uh, yeah. So essentially, a, a lot of kind of what we do is the requirements gathering, understanding that problem, understanding. Um, the, the context in which that problem exists, the requirements for solving that problem, um, and, and translating those into um, artifacts and user stories and, and that, that can then be passed on to developers to develop uh, the solution from. So we work with the business, with users to understand the problem and, and what that needs to happen to solve that problem. And we pass that over on then to the smart people to actually fix it. Thanks. Um, Charles has been our uh, excellent sort of uh, commentary on here, though, though I think the, the first one we kind of we talked about Ed and said, that, you know, this is definitely a thing that we uh, we we do deal with. Uh, and and really, the, the, the point for me is sometimes sometimes you have to unask the question, you know, roll roll back from what's being asked and, and unask it, get back to that um, get back to those questioning techniques um, really sort of break things down. And, and hopefully we've given a few ways to, to be able to do that. Um, Ed, five Ws, yeah. are just the same questions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I purposely left out timescales on this because um, it's not about like asking these questions over weeks where you've got someone on the phone because their uh, network's down and they can't do any work. Like, there's an immediacy there that that problem needs to be solved and you need to work out what that is. Um, so there's a probably a little bit around kind of a triage you can quickly get through these understand them whilst you're on the phone with someone understand what their problem is put in a solution whether that's interim or long term but a lot of time on incident management um we'll do kind of hot fixes we'll do immediate fixes to just get through the problem there and then but we may want to come back around and spend a little bit longer on these five lines to understand what the bigger problem is and put in a better longer term solution as well so it, it, it's not a one and done um you can go back over and absolutely just sort of in the 10 minutes i've got you i need to understand this so i can get you working again but we're going to come back around to this and look on at a larger scale so we can put in a better solution okay um james hey james um yeah, thanks for that. Uh, we will be sharing the recordings externally. Probably we'll we'll get everything for for all of the answer talks up after the digital festival. So so watch this space. I'm more than happy to to share that with people. So would your approach differ if you join a project mid-flight? Um, what what are the thoughts there, Ed? On you know we've we've obviously we will go in at various different stages as a consulting firm. So uh, so what do you think? Yeah, so a lot of the time we'll still always start off um, with a discovery. We, we need to find out what is known at that point in time. And, and again, the five W's fit nicely into that discovery period. What is it that we're doing? Who are we doing it for? Why are we doing it? Um, but it doesn't have to be four or five weeks. You could do a, a day or two, just get the project team together, understand where we're at and go through that. Immediately you're finding yourself, you're up to speed, you're, you're getting onboarded quicker uh, and you're, you're able to sort of hit the ground running and go a bit faster um if if, if it's a really well documented project uh, i'm yet to come off uh, or find a project even one of my own um that is that well documented that someone can just walk in pick up all the documentation and run with it um so you'd, you'd always be wanting to ask these questions mid-flight I, I never have any concerns of bringing a project right back to the start right back to the requirements phase if i join mid-flight and i don't think the project has everything it needs uh, it's a difficult conversation to have with stakeholders, but uh, one of our core principles at Answers is we do the right thing in the right way. And if we don't believe that we're on that path, we'll always try and, and have that conversation and, and 
it's not about putting the brakes on, but it's about making sure that we're going forward well. Yeah, absolutely. Just to, to add to that, um, absolutely right about the, the documentation side of things, what, what's existing there that you, you can look at and, and fall back on. It, documentation, if it's just talking about uh, what was done, then great. But realistically, you need some context, some, some maybe like a decision record of, of why decisions were made in a certain way. Realistically, you probably would hope that there was the right decision for that time. But things do move on over time. And unless you can see the context of why a decision was made at a given time, it's really difficult to, to pick something up and, and just run with it. Uh, and it really helps sometimes, as you say, to, to do the right thing in the right way and then say, well, hold on, let's, let's actually just revisit this. Okay, uh, we've, we've exhausted the questions on Slido, but um, we've got a bit of time still, so happy to open the floor to, to anyone on the call if they're here, they want to speak up and ask a question to us. I can see just in the chat, actually, there's one from Martin. Martin. Hi, um, sorry, just um, with the whys, obviously that's, uh, you'll have found it with, with your toddler there, it can be a bit abrasive, yeah. right, can't it? Um, and, and they're a little bit forward. So how would you go about kind of opening somebody up uh, or somebody who is kind of a little bit closed when you start? How would you then kind of elevate that a little bit to do that? Yeah, I, I think um, so people people can be closed off. Uh, it, it, people open up when you form that emotional connection with them. So moving away from the actual project and the questions that you want to ask and just spending a bit of time getting to know that person, getting to know what it is that motivates them, what drives them, and then linking the questioning and linking um, what you're going to be talking about into that um, can really help them open up. If they can see that actually by, by talking to you and discussing with you, they're going to get that solution and that, that outcome that they really want, um, that they'll, they'll start having better conversations but it really is about connecting with the person if, if you feel like they're a little bit closed off don't don't dive in and don't go straight into the, those questions get to know them talk about yourself a little bit what your experience is give them a little bit of, let them build trust in you essentially that, that you're going to listen to them and react to them brilliant thank you for that Okay, any, any other questions from anyone? All good. All right, well, no, thanks very much everyone for joining. Uh, it's been really good to, to talk through this with people. Um, thanks for the interaction. Thanks for the questions. Um, as we say, we'll, we'll put videos up for people to, to kind of watch back later. Um, hope you enjoyed it. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your Leeds Digital Festival uh, the rest of your day. Have a great one and thanks again. See you soon. Thanks all.